four, three, go. I gotta get my script. Welcome to another interview for the Kansas City Garment Industry Project. Today is May 7th, 2010. I'm John Dvorak, and I'm interviewing Mary Lou Chalmers who had a long career in the Kansas City garment industry in the 50s and 60s. The videographer is Mark Titus. Mary Lou, you were born in Cameron, Missouri. Tell me how you got from there to a career in the Kansas City garment industry. Okay, well, I was, I was an only child. My mother died when I was four, so my aunt raised me on a farm. I had no one to play with, so I entertained myself with drawing and I drew pretty dresses and was all uh, pretty women pretty dresses and made little stories about them so from the time I was a child I knew that's what I wanted to do and my father saw that I went to the Kansas City Art Institute at that time they had a fashion design department for design and pattern making it was the whole Everson Hall building it was a whole building devoted to it what types of things did you study there? Pattern making and design, and draping and any sketching. Uh, in fact, illustration. That was another big deal at that time. The the um, the ads in the newspapers. Most of them had illustrations then. Where now they have photographs. They had beautiful Harsfels, Wolf Brothers. The the ads were beautiful illustrations and. Of course, that was part of our training, too. Did you graduate with uh, a degree from No, there? I did not. My father had a heart attack when I was the middle of my junior year, and I went home to take care of him. And then I returned to take, after, after he recovered a little bit, I, I returned and went to Isabel Bolden School of, De of Design, which was pattern making. And I went there for two years, and then I went to, if you can believe it, Fanny Fern Fitzwater School of Fashion Illustration at 37th and Main. I went there for a year. So I really had three, almost six years of college, but I had no degree. When did you stop training and start working? 1957. I went to work after I finished the uh, illustration. I was getting married and I wanted to get a job, so I, my first position was at Rice Moore Coat and Suit, 7th and Broadway. I applied for jobs at different uh, companies around Kansas City, which was interesting at that time. Nellie Don, which was a prestigious place to work, and Gay Gibson, the two biggies here. Nellie Don paid $45 a week. Rice Moore Coat and Suit, paid 60 so I went with the $60 and it was on the second floor of a building at 7th and Broadway and I'm telling you no air conditioning the factory was on the same floor as a design department and my boss was Alex Catalano who was a he had had a business uh, which was world famous beautiful Italian design coats and so he was the head designer, and I worked for him, and I designed children's coats. It was fun. He was wonderful. The owners were lovely to me, but it was a horrendous place to work. It was so dirty. The floors in those old buildings, they'd come around all during the day and sweep and dust, and I was, all <coughs> I was always coughing and sputtering. So I don't remember how, but I think the lady that I'd gone to pattern school, uh, uh, Betty, uh, Nancy Frox, in Iola, Kansas, then asked me to design women's dresses. And this was in Iola, Kansas. So I took that immediately because it was a real fussy place to work. And I would have to catch the bus at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to Iola, Kansas. And I would stay with the owner and his wife for two or three days during the week and then take the bus back and do then my pattern making and sketching and everything the other two days in Kansas City. So then one day, my husband was at the Art Institute and the lady left a note in his box and said that Gay Gibson 
was looking for a, uh, an assistant fashion coordinator. And she thought of me. She remembered me from the Art Institute. And so I just flew down there and applied for the job. Evidently, I don't know for sure, but they said there were 75 girls that applied. I, <laughs> they, I got there and they put me in a little room, told me to undress and, and put this dress on me. And I thought, what in the world is going on? Well, Lord heaven, I fit the size eight and nine model dresses. So be darned if I didn't, I got the job. I was on top of the world. I had the best job. It was, it was $75 a week. What year would that have been? Oh, about 1960. I didn't start the garment industry until 57, and I left in 78. You, even before you worked for Gay Gibson, did you have fun at those first jobs that you had? Oh yeah, I, the people, the people in the garment, the, the operators, the designers, everybody, they were just fabulous. They were always doing things. They weren't grumpy, they were making. They'd come to, you'd go to work on Monday morning and someone would have made something or built something or cooked something. Interesting people. They were just not wool. They were always fun to be around. Yeah, I liked it. I liked the people. Gay Gibson was one of the big, well-known companies. Gay and Gibson. It was an achievement on your part to oh, work for them, I imagine. I was it? thrilled to death. And the, uh, the designer, the head designer, Dick Dumas, uh, they fitted, he fitted his original dresses on me and they gave them to me. And these pure silk, gorgeous dresses that would never be duplicated for stock. I had all these beautiful, beautiful clothes and it was so much fun going to work in the morning. You just couldn't wait to put high heels and hose and waist cinchers and I loved it. It was exciting. The people were fabulous. It was never dull, never boring. Couldn't wait. What did you do for Gay Gibson? Well, I started, uh, well, of course, I had the background to do everything, but they hired me to be the assistant fashion coordinator, and so I assisted uh, a Gwen Green, who was the head lady, and I, I organized the, uh, the fashion shows from the I fitted the models, the, the original garments, and then I would, I would follow it all the way through from the very design original sketch to the pattern department. I would make sure it looked like the, the, gar the pattern looked like the dress that was intended from the designer through the samples, I mean, how, how many samples they made. I did the sketches for each item, and there would be like, 70 or 80 dresses in each line. We had five lines a year. So, and then we had a fashion show at the end of every, at the end of the spring and fall lines. And then I would arrange the fashion show. I fit the models and put on the show. In fact, one year I, I loved it. I just couldn't wait. I had such a good time and did such a good job that Paul Wilson for the first time I'd ever been to New York, he gave my husband and myself a all paid expense trip to New York for a week. It was fabulous for me. The dresses that you worked on, where would they have been sold? Would they have gone all over the United all States? All over the United States. Mostly small towns, but you know, at that time, that they people bought in their country towns. And Gay Gibson was a big, stylish house. They did beautiful dresses that were on in high-class magazines. How did you feel as a young woman? You were in your late 20s by then, I guess. How did you feel knowing that you were designing dresses oh. that were going all over the United States? I loved it. I loved it. Smile all the time. Loved it. Couldn't, couldn't have been more exciting, couldn't have been happier. The people, fabulous, and the, you know, and, well, too, when, the, when it all fell apart at the very end, all these fabulous people, they scattered all over the country. And so, as a result, I've got great friends from coast to coast. That Most of the people left. Now, the names on here, some of them 
some of them came back to retire, but every most of the people left. What was Gay Gibson like to work with in terms of uh, uh, pay, benefits? For example, did you have health insurance oh, yeah. at that time? Yeah. So it was considered a good job oh, yeah. uh, in it the was, context of Kansas City I at that was, time? Oh, all my friends just couldn't wait because I could get dresses, beautiful dresses, just for half price or more than that. It was, it was, it was on the fifth floor, 2716 Grand. That's, you know, Crown Center and all that business. That's where it was. And my... Where I, my office, where I had the sketches on the wall of all the designs, that was where we fitted everything and where the conferences were held. And the big window looked over to the, the memorial. So that was all open then. The Liberty Memorial. The Liberty Memorial. Uh -huh. You mentioned how you enjoyed working with your uh, other employees. How were the bosses? Did you know them, and were they the, good to work with? Oh or not? yeah, Gay Gibson. They were wonderful. Paul Paul Wilson was just as nice to me as he could be. They were all great. Uh, you know, I, I okay. The design department then they decided to grow, and so de elected to move most of the design and pattern making to New York. I was honored. They, he asked me to move with the department, and I was just clicking my heels. I was so proud and so felt so special, and then went to the country and told my aunt that it raised me. I was moving to New York, and she started crying. I couldn't do it, so I came back and told Paul Wilson I didn't want to move to New York. And he said, okay, kid. I mean, he, he called me kid. Okay, kid, you can stay here. So I stayed in Kansas City, but it was boring after that. All the crazy people were in New York. I wanted to be, I wanted to be where the crazies were. So I left after a while and then decided to, I stayed home for a few months. That didn't go well. So then I, I think the next job I went to Danny Dare, which made children's clothes and, and uh, Betty Rose coats. Uh, then. Then Nellie Don finally went back to Nellie Don, and they were all very lovely people. Then I went to Mendel Silverman's, which was the, that was the crazy place in Kansas City. They made upscale women's dresses, mostly half-size dresses. But the experience at that place, I can't imagine ever could be repeated. He was feared by everybody, even the salesmen that would come there from all over the country. That, <laughs> well, most of them would have a flask in their hind pocket they'd have to nip on before they'd have the courage to go upstairs to see him. Was he gruff or was he truly kind of a nasty fellow? Both. <laughs> I mean, do you have to be one or the other? He, he was both. And he would, he would fire... Okay, he and the designer, they would have these great monumental fights and scream and yell at each other. She'd go in the ladies' room to get away from him, and he'd stand out the, outside and wait for her to come back at Jenny Schmidt. Oh, he'd stand outside the window. And wait until she came out. So she'd whisk past him, past him, and she'd go into her room. She had tranquilizers, and they'd still be screaming and yelling at each other. She'd get in her drawer and she'd swallow a few tranquilizers. Give me some, he'd say. And she'd give him tranquilizers, and then they'd start all over again. Well, did you enjoy working there? <laughs> oh, yeah, because we all banded together. The most unbelievable, that man, he hired the best talent that he could find. He, I, I'm a little country girl from Cameron, Missouri. This man had a Japanese pattern maker. He had a black um, cutter. He, had, the head of the pattern department was Joe Costa, who had liberated some concentration camp during World War II. We had Rosa Gold, who was a uh, an operator. She had the concentration stamp on her arm. Really, a lady from Afghanistan. A couple gay guys, uh, uh, a German German girl 
uh, one girl whose father had been in the SS in World War II, another girl whose father had been in the service, and we we had a wonderful time. We would all get together at noon and everybody would bring their special ethnic dishes and we'd share it and we'd go to things after work together. Now this was at Silverman's? Yes, sir. Mendel Silverman. So you had a very diverse workforce. Oh, it was it was great. It was, yes, very diverse. Did you I all, mean, everybody. You all got along just yeah, fine? Yeah, we got along. He <laughs> he smoked a cigar. He had a smoke cigar. And he'd try to sneak up on you and catch you not working, but we could all smell the cigar before he got there. <laughs> and we'd pass the word, the smell is coming, here comes a cigar. <laughs> and he'd, he, he, I had a, I, I'd worked there a couple times, and the last time I had this big room all by myself, and I'd be in there working away, and then I'd hear the door open, and he'd, be, he'd try to catch you not working, you know, and I always was fortunately working. But if you didn't, if he, if you were in his disfavor, he'd fire you. We were on the fifth floor, and he'd say, "You're fired. You're out of here. Get on the elevator." He, you'd go down. He'd be on the next elevator, following them to hire them back. You know, a little more money. <laughs> Where was this? What was the address? Uh, it's right at Eighth and um, Broadway, off Eighth and Broadway. Mm -hmm. There, where the Phoenix is, across from where the Phoenix is now. Yeah. Now, a lot of the companies in the garment industry are owned by Jewish men, mm -hmm. but you're, you're telling me the workforce w was not Jewish necessarily, it was mm -hmm. all sorts of people, is that? I never thought about it like that. The, the operator, Rosa Gold, was uh, Jewish. The owner was Jewish. Several of them, uh, Betty Rose, uh, Danny Dare, uh, Oh golly, I still can't remember the one they were. They were all Jewish owners. Uh -huh. Were a lot of the workers uh, immigrants from Europe, or were some of them people like you who were from around uh, here? Around here, they they were smart enough to import a lot of the Germans who had the real talent for patterns and quality. A lot of them, they especially Mendel and and. Uh, Anyway, yeah, a lot of the Germans, and they're still dear, dear friends of mine. Love those people. Nellie Don is kind of the most famous garment company in Kansas City. Tell me what you did for them and how it was to work there. Oh, the first time, <clears throat> it was wonderful. They had, they even had a, uh, the first job I had at Nellie Don was designing. It was unbelievable. I'd gone from I'd gone from Gay Gibson, and then I'd stayed home for a while, and then went to Nellie Don, and uh, they had a, a nurse, a whole room for the nurse. If you had too much to drink the night before, you just go in and sleep it off the next day. They had a beautiful cafeteria. The food was extraordinary. So did Gay Gibson, by the way. Uh, but they also had a little grocery store where you could go during the day and go down and buy your, they had the finest cuts of meats and vegetables and everything. Do your grocery shopping. In the company? In the company. This was over here. That was the old beautiful building that's over here where Montgomery Wards in that area is now. Down oh, in. up there by Belmont, on Belmont or yeah, something? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. That's where Nellie Don was located? There was a beautiful old building over there which they built and that's where it was the first time I went there to work. And and then at the end of the day, when you were done with your work, you walked out the door and the doorman was standing there with your groceries all sacked and ready to go home. And at Christmas, I'll never forget, as a designer, they had a limo, or I guess it was a limo. Anyway, we could go down, we would go down downtown to Horace Fells or wherever and do our Christmas shopping. And then when we were done, they'd take us back to work. Hmm. Yeah, really got spoiled. What did you do for Nelly Don? Then at that time I designed. So you designed some of the dresses uh -huh. that made uh -huh. them famous? Well, no. They were famous before I got there. <laughs> no, I didn't do anything that made them. It was just they, I think those days where they were 
back off their glory days, but they were still big in the business. There were a lot of workers there, I mm -hmm. take it? Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you how many. But then after that, they moved over to North Kansas City, 16th and Swift, and that's where I spent a few years. As, then I, I left there, and, and then I think I went to Slim Maker for a while. Yeah, I went to Slim Maker, which was another business down near where the Phoenix is now, and uh, did a couple, designed a couple lines there, and at the end of one of the lines, the guy said, just not good, you know, we don't like what you've done, goodbye. So they fired me. I was so, I was so taken back by it, and uh, so then I went to work at Nellie Don. After I'd gone to work at Nellie Don, they called me back and the line had sold and wanted to rehire me. It was too late. <laughs> I'd already had another job. But that's just kind of the way it was, you know. You just kind of, or the way I was, I guess. If I didn't like it, I left. Well, Betty Rose, I, Betty Rose, I went there. They hired me one time and put me in a room and said, just go through magazines and brochures and just look at what we do and then we'll get back and work with you. Well, they put me in this little room and I was there forever and ever and ever and I just about went nuts. And so finally one day I just walked in and told the other girls around there, well, goodbye, I'm leaving. So I went home, they never missed me and they never, I never told anybody anything. And they said when the guy came back in another week or two later and said, well, I need to work with Mary Lou now. Oh, she's gone. Well, what happened? Did they just not want you or? Well, they did, but they just kept me on the back burner until they were ready to do something. And hmm. I couldn't. I you felt wouldn't. forgotten about. Yeah, just in this little room all by myself. Yeah. You worked for a large number of companies. Did, why did you bounce around like that as opposed to trying to stay at one place? Well, I would have stayed at Gay Gibson if they had stayed here. They chose to move to New York. I'd still be there. I would have retired there had I been there. And I liked it at Nellie Don. There were just reasons for the other companies. Some of them were just pretty erratic and not... Nellie Don was was good, uh, but it was going downhill toward the end, and they brought some new mo money manager people in that didn't know anything about design, and I don't know. It did, at the time, it didn't seem like a lot when I look at it, it does. <laughs> I really, I was at Gay Gibson like seven years, Nellie Don probably six or seven total. So the, the other places I was in, oh, and I, I did freelance work, so, so it wasn't all just that I walked away. Some of it was. Were you ever fired other than that one time? Uh, no. No, no, as a matter of fact, just that one time, yeah. Now, I understand that some of your Patterns got quite a bit of recognition. Can you tell me about a couple of Yeah, them? one one dress made the cover of Cosmopolitan. I can still remember the, the make of it, the look of it. Another one made a national ad in uh, 17. So, yeah, I was pretty proud of that. Do you have those covers? No, I don't. No. I threw them all out. Excuse me, I'm sorry. What years were the, were the uh, Cosmo in the 70s? Early 60s, mid 60s? Was your name on the cover or just no. your dress? No, just the dress. Well, I remember you? Paul Wilson calling me, hey kid, I'm proud of you, look at this, you know. He was, Why didn't you keep that? Well, I, I lived north of the river. We were moving over to Hyde Park. I, I had the stack of books like that in the closet. That uh, the, I had one whole closet full of these dresses and magazines, and I hadn't looked at them for years. I didn't have any friends around that were interested in them. I just wasn't, it was in the past. I just sh tossed it. I don't know why. You must have, I mean, again, as a young woman in your 30s at that time, I guess, you must have thought that's pretty awesome to be on the cover of a national magazine, didn't you? Yeah, I did, oh yeah, I don't, yeah, I was proud of it. Now you said you left 
Nellie Don because it was starting to go downhill? Well, <clears throat> came in to work one day, and this is over in the over uh, in North Kansas City, and they had gone in over the weekend and just moved everybody into one big room. We were all piled on top of each other, and I don't know, I had other things I wanted to do with my life, so I just said goodbye. Did you have a sense that they were not oh, doing yeah, that well? They, they were letting people go. And Hal Harden was the president. No, I get no. He had been the. I'm not sure if he was the president at that time or not. But then he did start his own business. Uh, Hal Harden, who had been the president of Nelly Don, so then I did work for him. Well, that's why there are a lot of names on here because I did freelance work for several companies. Hal Harden being one of them. Now, were you a union member? No. Were you ever a union member? No. Why not? Was that because of your position? Because of the design, yeah. I, I was never, I, it wasn't on the time clock or I didn't belong to the union. Uh -huh. Did a lot of workers uh, belong to, to unions? Yes. They were, yes, very talented, very capable. They had a uh, sample department at both Gay Gibson and Nellie Don with these extraordinarily talented little women that would make the garments and they belonged to the union. But I don't, I don't know if it's the truth or not, but I, I heard them say that those, when they retired, those women got like $7 a month from the union. So I don't, that I don't know if it's true or not. But they did, the factory and the cutters and the operators did belong to the union. You got in the industry in the mid-50s. Was the late union, 50s, late 50s, 57. Was the union already beginning to sort of decline in its importance then as opposed to earlier in the century or do you know? I don't know, I don't think, I think it was a important then, maybe. I don't know, I don't know that much about the union. Did you ever have any problems because of the union strikes or that sort no. of thing? No, that was long before I came, no. Not while you were, mm -mm. were in the no. industry. What was your last job in the industry? Oh, well, it would have been at, uh, no, let's see. I, okay, I did some, uh, Hal Harden, he started his own, apparel business. He had it in North Kansas City and then he moved over near uh, Southwest Traffic Way and when they needed extra help they would call me and I'd help out with patterns, making patterns. What was the name of his company? Al Harden Apparel. Approximately when was that? What, what years did you work there? <sighs> oh gosh, I, I don't know. Eight, eight, maybe 80, 1980 maybe, I'm not sure. And then you left the industry? Yeah. Why did you leave the industry? There wasn't anything, it was all, it wasn't fun anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't, there was no more excitement, it was just going away. Mm -mm. When did you realize that the industry was in decline? Well, I guess at Nellie Don toward the, in the 70s. How did you feel about that when well, you, once you recognized that there was I, a decline? I hated it, but I, and I, I just, I remembered what it was like to be at Gay Gibson during those fabulous, exciting, creative days where you'd, you'd look at a garment and you'd spend hours making sure that the sleeves were just right, that there were no puckers, that the hemlines were where they should be, that the lining was perfect, that the seams had the right seam on them. And, and then as time went on, it was just like, you know, you know let it go, whatever. Didn't, it, the quality, the perfection, I didn't find that in any place but Gay Gibson. I, I mean, it was like that at Nellie Don, I guess, before I got there, but I was, oh man, I don't, I was kind of surprised to see hymns that puckered and, 
you know, they were so particular at Gay Gibson. Everything had to be just perfect. And if it wasn't, it didn't get in the line. Why do you think the industry deteriorated so much here? Well, the big stores, they went from the little, the world, the world changed from the country people in the small towns and look at downtown Kansas City, look at our, how it changed. It used to have Harsfells and Wolf Brothers and Mendens and all the beautiful shops and it's now, everything is the same everywhere. There's no more specialties. Did this, did the change have to happen? Do you think, was it just sort of a inevitable part of evolution or could something have been done to continue the good times? Well, I guess the good times are still there in the, in the upper scale garments in New York and the, the Bergdorf's and all the night, uh, you know, the nicer stores, they still have beautiful clothes. It's just that the, it's not that important anymore. The designs, the, the beautiful days are over. You know, we wear pants and it's different. But like the world is so different. People are different. The cities are where we all go. They, you know, they go to Walmart now. Do you shop at Walmart for clothes? No way. <laughs> what uh, what do you think of women's clothes today, or, or all clothes today? Well, I'm comfortable. I, I I'm with the world. I don't mind. I I don't have to wear the high heels and the hose and squeeze into a girdle every day. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Where do you shop for clothes? Oh boy, I I, I oh boy. Well, I like Chico's. I like. Uh, I like to make some of my own, not that much. I, I don't do that much shopping, frankly. Are there good quality clothes in Kansas City that women can buy today? Yeah, there. I mean, you can go to Halls, you can go to Nordstrom's. Yeah, they're expensive. There's shops out in the Overland Park. Yeah, buy the, spend the money. Did you ever think we would be in a position where a lot of our clothes are coming from China no, and wherever? No, I can't imagine. Look at all the little communities around here that employed craftsmen and supervisors and all the little, all the machines and everything, that they're all gone now. They're, no, I can't imagine. All the people, that's all in China, India. Have dear special friends, German friends now that live in Maryland, and they are with they're in the garment industry, and they are craftsmen, and they're at quality control, and they travel all over the world. He just got back from Hong Kong last week. You know, it's amazing the way they do now. And 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 I visited a friend at uh, and Eddie Bauer in Chicago. In fact, that Martin Bosch that's on there, and he was showing me the way patterns are done now. You do it on the computer, you make a line on the computer, you push a button, it goes into a grading room, it's automatically graded, you push another button, it goes to Hong Kong, where they spread it out and they cut it. You know, in, back in the ancient times, we did all this by hand, and if there was a little eighth of an inch off, like at Gay Gibson, you made the correction, and you fitted a little pinch in and a pinch there, and you made the pattern correction. It's gone now. It's amazing. It's all computerized. Do you like that? Well, I'm not part of it, so I guess I like it, but I don't, yeah, I guess. Clo I tell you what, clothes are pretty cheap now compared to what they, they were then. I mean, you can buy a, the prices haven't gone up that much comparatively speaking with other items, clo uh, furniture and cars and everything. You know, you don't, you don't spend that much. Before computers, when you were designing, let's say you were going to design a dress right now, you would do it all by hand. Yeah, well, I'd st you'd start with, you pick out the fabric, you, if, well, you plan a line, you make a line, and here are the colors, you, this, the colors that you want to put in the lines. So then 
You pick that and you decide what you need in a line. You need a costume, you need a dress, you need pants, you need a shirt. And you arrange it all and then you, you take the fabric and you'd have it on your table, like I have that table downstairs, and uh, a sketch pad and you sketch out the design and present it or go ahead and drape it on the form if it needs to be draped. And then from the draping on the form, you put it on the table and you make a pattern from it. You have a block, a the, basic block that you start with. What you hung was actually cloth, a, yeah. a, a mm -hmm. depiction of what your, mm -hmm. your line would look like. Mm -hmm. And you did that all yourself? Yeah. You would cut the cloth and yeah. put it on yeah. the... Yeah. Yes. At what point would your line get approved? Well, that was the trick. You would, uh, okay, you drape it, you make the pattern, then you take it out to the cutter, and they spread out the fabric on the table with your pattern that you've made, and they take a yardage of it to see how much material it takes, and so they can figure the cost of it in the end of it. And then they take it to the the operators, the wonderful operators that knew how to put everything together. So she's outside your room. She's in the machine over here, sewing up this pattern. And you work with her while she's sewing it. If you forgot something or a notch doesn't match, she brings it in and you know, what did you do this for? And okay, that's wrong, I'll correct it. So you make corrections on that pattern while this operator, this is the original garment, while this operator is sewing up the original garment. So when it's completed, then, then comes the big moment when you submit your design and you either show it on the form or you put it on a model, which was often the case, and then you go into the president and you show this model and then they discuss it. They take the yardage and how much labor they think goes into it and then they figure the cost of it. So then at the end of it, it's usually like five lines a year, so at the, at the end then they put all these garments together and see which ones are feasible, which ones they can produce. Very often that first dress really gets ripped apart because it's too expensive, you need to take the tuck out of here or, or too much fabric or it, it, the collar is wrong and then you may have to do a whole new pattern maybe once or even twice, and then back out to the cutter, new yardage, new operator sewing the garment. And then they put these, this whole group together at the end of the line and uh, price it. It all has to be compatible. It all has to flow. And so then they make however many garments they need for the salesman's samples. I mean, it could be 20 to 30, 40, 50 salesmen that are on the road that take these samples. And there were groups of samples. It wouldn't just be one dress out of one fabric. It would be a group of garments out of coordinating fabrics, complementary fabrics. So then the salesmen go on the road with all these garments and they go around the country and they present these garments to the buyers and then, well, okay, so that, I, well, I told you, they make the salesmen samples, and so the salesmen take them on the road. So then they come back to the company with what sells and what doesn't sell, and then they order what the, where the trick came in for these people. They had to order fabric guessing on what they think would sell, and it isn't always what's sold. See, they had to go ahead and order fabric, and I'm sure that's what they have to do now order the fabric before the salesmen take it on the road to know what's really going to sell. And then when they do know, that's when they come back and then cut large amounts. Often we would have a fashion show at the, before they call all the salesmen in and have a fashion show where you'd show all the garments on models and give them the big pep talk about what's going to be great and this is the look of the season and these are the new colors and everything. When the salesman would come back then you would find that if 
that, that if a line that yeah. you had designed was very much favored, then they would tell yeah. you that they had got a lot of sales. Well, you'd know by because you'd get the reports all the time. Yeah. Did you ever have lines that just didn't sell at all, that nobody liked? Well, I never, well, yeah, I got fired that one time. Well, no, then it sold, so, no. But usually your, your thing sold pretty well? I was, okay, yeah, I guess. I never got, just the once. <laughs> Was there any rivalry between designers about oh, yeah. that you'd say oh, my my item sold, yours didn't was, and stuff it, like that? Well not not out in the open. <laughs> <laughs> not so obvious. Oh yeah, sure. There was always a little competition. But mostly we all got along and got and enjoyed our work. Do people you talk to today, friends of yours or relatives, realize that all of this went on in Kansas City? Probably not. Just think of it. I mean, my last day was in 78. Just look. I, mean, I can't believe it. Because there's virtually none of this going on no. in Kansas City today. I, I don't know. I think there may be some few places, that little, little places. There's some young designers down in the... Uh, Downtown that are you know down that are doing some creative, wonderful, wild stuff, but you know nothing that would sell all over the country probably. It's kind of a forgotten part of Kansas yeah. City's history in a way. I think about these these multi-talented these women. I'm telling you. Well, my little my little friend the Germans that are dear friends now that live in Maryland that he he just got back from Hong Kong. She came to this country and couldn't speak English. I'll never forget them saying what great hands she had. Mindell Silverman made very complicated. I mean, those jackets would have 40 or 50 pieces of patterns in them, very intricate. And she could sit there at that machine and make a garment in one morning, everybody. She did, at a power machine, she'd just be sitting there, rah, 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 rah. and we were all, you know, anybody else would be going, like that, but Helga, she was, they were very capable, smart, talented people. Do you still uh, sew today? Yes, but not like I, I can't, not like I, there's, no. Lifestyle has changed, not really the need for it. Could you design a, a, a dress or a jacket today if you wanted yeah, to? I, oh yeah, yeah Have you ever still thought? there. Have you ever thought of doing it just for the heck Well, of I've it? made some clothing, yeah, in the last few years. I've made quite a bit, but I, I do occasionally. But. Do your friends come to you and say, can you make me something for this party no. or something like no, that? No, because I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did a while back, but I don't do it. I don't do it anymore. Well, let me ask a wrap-up question. Uh, what would you like future generations to know about the garment industry in Kansas City that, that you worked in? It was exciting. We worked together. It was multicultural. It was a more, those years were more fun than you could ever, ever imagine. And the, the five lines a year to get one of those lines. You'd have like two weeks after a line to maybe take a deep breath and go to New York and look at new stuff. But it was fun. People were wonderful. The work, the, it was just a great, great time. Exciting. I can't imagine not having been in it. I'm very happy I was. That's a good way to end the interview. Max. I no. don't know when I've talked. No. You probably have never heard all this. Well, you? when did you run into this guy? This character? Yeah. Oh, this cool. character. Well, my... Are, are, is this the guy who carried the torch for you all those years? No. The... We went to high school <laughs> together and and he, my best friend, he, he married my best friend. Well, and can we... you come over and sit next to her while I do a personal interview of your no. relationship? Okay. Oh my gosh, this isn't going to be on anything. No, this is work. This is just for fun. Okay. This is okay. for you guys. Oh, well, this is fun, i got to tell you. <laughs> Max and I went to high school together, my dear friend. In Cameron? In Cameron, mm -hmm. Missouri. 
and my dear friend, they were the high school sweethearts, so I'm not going to waste time flirting with him. He was taken. So they get married. He goes his way. I go my way. My first husband died of cancer, and I remarried and met this guy and moved to Lakewood. And I'd never gone to a class reunion because my husband's birthday was over the 4th of July, and that's usually when the reunions uh -huh. were. So I had a girlfriend call from Cameron, and she said, I'm going to the reunion. Why don't you go with me? And I said, okay. So I went with her, walked in the door, and there was Rosalie, Max's wife. Rosalie, my God, where have you been? And how I'm going to... And it, she's, and it turned out that we lived, we both, I was just moving to Lakewood, my husband, and we were redoing a house over there. And she said, you don't mean you're the house with all the new windows. And I said, yeah, we're putting in 34 new windows. And she said, Mary Lou, you live right across the lake from us. So here was Rosalie and Max. About and 100 yards. Away. Yeah, we waved at each other the next morning. So, so then we be, all became friends and we'd go out to dinner and we'd meet at the clubhouse and just became buddies again. Well, then my dear husband, he got cancer and he died November 2001. Rosalie and Max, God love them, they kept me on their guest list and when they were going out to dinner or going to some place, they'd call and invite me to go with them. And so that house in Lakewood was too much for me. I needed to scale back. So I found then bought this house, moved over here. And so she she called me this Wednesday and said, we're going to dinner tonight. We'll come pick you up. I said, great. Well, then she called back and she said, I don't feel well, Mary Lou. Let's take a rain check. Okay. I never thought anything about it. And then that Sunday night, the phone rang and it was a friend from Cameron and said, did you hear about Rosalie Jackson? And I said, what are you talking about? She had, well, you could tell, she, she. She uh, had rheumatoid arthritis and uh, she took a lot of medication for it. And it probably destroyed her immune system. And she died of an uh, infection, yeah, went to heart the, attack ultimately. But took her to the hospital that night happened. that we were all mm -hmm. going out to dinner. I didn't. I didn't know. They thought I, they all thought I was in, I was supposed to go back to Maryland to visit these German friends. And so they didn't call me. They thought I was out of town. So that, she was, a year later after my husband died, then Max is Rosalie. And so we was, And Max and Rosalie had been married for like 40 years or so? 49 and a half. Yeah, almost 50. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So then a few months go by and we had the same friends and we, Finally, one day he asked me to go to a movie, and that, that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you know some of this stuff, or did you learn something from our interview? I learned some new things, yes. I've heard a little bit of it when she's talking to her friends. But it's kind of like a, a, her former life, uh -huh. which you weren't a part of at that, you, That's right. that no, particular he, time. He, went, he became an engineer at Ford Motor. He started his family early. He was in the Air Force, started his family, and then... When he got out, he came to he went to work and went to school at night, and then he went to school during the day and worked at night. Mm -hmm. Ended up with a retirement as an engineer at Ford over there. Now, did you work much after leaving the garment industry, Mary Lou? No, I started my own line of skincare products. I developed a line of natural skincare products. Which, really? Yeah. <laughs> Do you still work that line? No, I didn't. I I gave it to a young girl a couple years ago and I don't I don't think it's done too well so but I used to ship it all over the country what was the name of it Marley M-A-R-L-E and what was so special about it natural skin care natural products that required refrigeration that didn't have a lot of preservatives and flavors and do you still do your own make uh, makeup you I still make up your own I do. cosmetics and I stuff have, oh, well I still have my from that long yeah. I still have it. You know, I guess I didn't ask you precisely if you modeled when you were in the industry. And I did in the beginning, but I outgrew it. <laughs> did, did you do much of that, or was that really not? No, it was more in-house modeling. I well, just, you said, excuse me, when you said when you started, they threw a size 8 on you and it fit, and yeah. that was like 
an epiphany for yeah. you. Yeah, I did. Well, I happened. I'm short. Uh huh. But um, they they let me do it. And they I I had the background, and I happened to squeeze into their dresses, so I got the job. And it was great because then they fitted all these fabulous. Oh, I wish I had those dresses now, but I don't. Well, I couldn't get in them. You know, I we were told by one person we talked to that there are collections all over town, hidden away in little places of dresses from, I don't know, this manufacturer or that manufacturer. Mm -hmm. There's no museum, there's no centralized right. place where this stuff comes together, but uh, I'm told, we were told that there's a lot of stuff that's available around See, town. See, I would have had to. That people preserve, but unfortunately there's no way of showing it publicly it's just you know it's all out there but Diane the lady that doesn't want to talk to you she had a lot and I think she gave a lot of it to the Ann Bromfield or or they have that uh, I think she has I don't know but she didn't she was she's the packer Diane is, never throws anything away and so she had all, I would think she still has some, but she's not, a, she's 85, 86 now and said she can't remember her own name, much less anything else. So, but Tana Harden, the other name on there, she, but see, she wouldn't have any of the old beautiful stuff. Now, they, the place that was downtown, the uh, furniture place where, uh, you know, where he used to have the dresses all hanging around. Oh. The furniture place. Oh yeah, it's at at Sixth and right on the corner down from the Phoenix toward the freeway. Oh, uh, Ogies, Ogies. Oh okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, well he had he had clothing from a, a lot of them. I don't know what happened to it, but he had uh, dresses and coats that I recognized. You never worked for uh, Good Now. Does that name ring a bell? Mm -hmm. They were a company in Kansas City that made, well, I guess they would have been gone by then, maybe. They were a company in Kansas City that made men's underwear. Oh, no. And this was before your time. But, <laughs> but we, we were told about that. And it turned out that their main building, well, they had several, but, but their last main building was at about 37th and, and Main Street, which is not too far from where I live. Oh, you're and, Hyde Parker? Uh, well, 45th and Warnell, just north oh. of the plaza. So I drove my wife by that building and we looked at it. It's empty, unfortunately, and it's 37th for sale. 37th and Main. 37 something, it's around the corner of Main. It's a, it's a you know, kind of a nondescript building. But I showed my wife this building. I said, you know what went on in there? Said, no. It says, they made a lot of men's underwear. She said, what? My <laughs> gosh. But that was way before your time, and I don't know when that company left Kansas City. You know where that theater is now? No, the building is exactly sitting there, empty, uh, for sale if you want to buy it. No. You're, you're talking about the Madrid yeah, it's theater? Right by, it's right it's by the, there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's right by there. But that just oh. struck me as interesting that in this building that I drive yeah. by a lot in my normal course of business, uh, made men's underwear for Well, 37th for and, I've, I mean, right in that block, one of the, I used to take fashion illustration classes at Fanny Fern Fitzwater School of, it's on, it's on there, Fanny Fern Fitzwater. Actually, before I forget, I need to ask you the spellings on some of those things. You told me that you went to two schools after, um, okay. What, what are the, the names of those so I can spell them? The, the, the first one was Fanny Fern Fitzwater. Fanny Fern, Fern Fitzwater. Fitzwater. Yeah. Is that F-A-N-N-Y? Yeah. F-E-R-N? Uh-huh. F-I-T-Z-W-A-T-E-R? I guess. School of Fashion. <laughs> Where was that located? Uh, 37th and Main. And that was like 54, 55, somewhere in there? Yeah. And you would take the streetcar to get there and stuff uh, like that? I, the, I, I lived at 3930 South Benton. A little, okay. a little lady 
took me in a boarding in a, house. It was a private home where I had the second, a uh, big apartment on the, not an apartment, just a room on the second floor, and I would take the 39th Street bus to Maine. I take it Fanny Fern Fitzwater is not in business anymore. No. <laughs> was she was a, an instructor at the Art Institute and got into a fuss with them and then left and started her own illustration. But like I say, that's when the magazines had these gorgeous illustrations. They weren't just photographs. I've they, seen those. Some of them oh, are really, really yeah. nice. What was the other school, Mary Lou? Oh, Isabel Bolden. She was a big deal. I-S-A-B-E-L-L-E -L -L -E Bolden. B-O-L-D-I-N. What was that? Sc uh, school, and she was at 44... 10 Warwick. And it was the Isabel Bolden School of Pattern, well, School of Design, but it was actually pattern making. And I lived with her. Who was she? She had been a, a teacher at the Kansas City Art Institute that left too. Oh. The, the design, fashion design at the Art Institute was a big deal when I first started. But then like I said, my junior year, my dad had that heart attack. I left, and by the time I was ready to come back, it was gone. They had dissolved the fashion department. I was going to say, do they still do that? And no. They I think they have fiber, years. and but they hmm. don't have... So those were the three schools you went to? And the Art Institute. And, yeah. um, we joked and laughed about, is it Silverman? Mendel, M-I-N-D-E-L, Silverman. What was the name of that company? Well, I don't know. We just used to call it Mendel, so maybe that's what it was. And his first name was M-I-N... M-E-N, I think. M-E-N-D-E-L. Listen, you guys, he was such a holy terror that he even got, somebody even shot at him in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, I'm not kidding. Well, why did you enjoy working with him then? Oh, I did. He would come up to me and say, oh, honey, is your husband being good to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, today, that could get you $500,000 in a lawsuit. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, but if he was such an ass, why did you enjoy working with him? Because the people. The people were fabulous, and he paid better. Here's the guy that he paid the best of anybody. He had to. Nobody would have worked with him. He had the best talent, the most creative, the most capable people. He paid more, and he had to, or they wouldn't have been there. Because he'd yell and scream. And, I mean, he but he was, also had an eye for who was good. He had yeah, an eye for talent, yeah, yeah. apparently, as um, well. He, they sold his dresses at Harsfells at the whatever floor was the better dresses. Hmm. Well, yeah, and besides we had fun there. It was just like we were all, can you imagine the different the flavors of people that would sit around and, and every, almost, even Afghanistan, a lady from everybody, and farm gals, and it was just, it was wonderful. Getting on that elevator. Oh, and at noon, <laughs> he would, we of course wore high heels, Helga and I, we would get on our, we would run downtown every day at noon as fast as we could to Macy's and shop or just look around and run back. He'd be standing there. He stood, he would stand there with his watch when you got on the elevator and he'd be standing there when you got back. <laughs> and he would tell you how late you were? Oh, you wouldn't be Three late. minutes late? <laughs> You were always, you'd be on time. <laughs> the other places were not quite that no, bad. No, no. Uh-uh. He was, he was notorious. And, and, I mean, if you talk to Helmut Hines, that other name I gave you, he worked there. Now, Helmut, Helmut was the guy, he would never yell at Helmut because he, he needed him. That's right there. Oh, right there. He needed Helmut badly. And he couldn't replace him. So I think one day Helmut told him not to ever talk to me like that again. And I guess he never did. Mm. Helmut Hines, Mendel's.
Oh, he was with Minda. Uh -huh. okay. I cannot remember the name of the the kids' place. Dick Pepperdine, Martin Zippel worked where Martin Bosch worked. Now, I cannot remember. But you said you've talked to Helmut, or you? you I, I called them, but she, he wasn't there. Wife. I talked to his wife, and she thought he would, and she thought Martin Bosch would too, because he likes to talk. Okay, but both of them are certainly. Still young enough to talk. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. oh, yeah. Did you say you made up a list of the companies you worked with? Did you, didn't you show me that? or I, Did I give it to you? You did not give it to me. I it's wanted... kind of horrendous. I sort of was ashamed of it. Oh, I don't know why you would be ashamed well, of it. Well, it's lengthy. <laughs> well, but you kind of explained why that was, why that was so. What is the name of the, the where... Where that all the Sprint Center is now, that famous Jewish guy. I can't. You still haven't gone. thought of that. No, I haven't. But they, these guys would know. My goodness, what was? Can I take this, or do you want? Yeah, this? you can. Have it. Okay, rice. That what is rice that? more coat and suit. Do you R want me to print it out? Do you want me to email, print it out, and email it? No, no, I'll take care of it here. R I C E M O R. R I C E M O R. Coat and suit. Uh -huh. And then this woman in Iola was uh, Nancy. Nancy Frocks. F. R O C K S. Is it Nancy's Frocks? Nancy. Or was it her name was Nancy Frock? It was the name of the business, was Nancy Frocks. Uh, Frocks for oh, dresses, right? Oh, okay. that's not a woman. No, oh. that was just the name of the business. Okay. Well, Iola, Kansas is kind of far away. I yeah, that's when I said I had to catch the bus at 5 o'clock. Yeah. Right, and that went down old. Uh, on 69 Highway? Lord, I don't know. On oh, 71 oh, Highway? 54. Yeah. 54. I don't know. Iowa, where the heck is Iowa? We went through there on our way. Uh, oh, it's quite it's a ways away. It's down in southeastern Kansas. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, is it Just, down past Emporia? No, is, it's not that far away. It's not away. that far. No. no. It's uh, Ottawa? They were lovely Stop people. Stop go south from Ottawa. So, okay. They were lovely people to work for, but you can imagine I was glad to find a place. So you'd, you'd go there for three days and then you I stayed with the family that right. owned the business. Howard, Harold, Harold something. And then you'd come back? Uh -huh. 54 and one That nine. is a long way. Now, Danny Dare. Yes, that is -E. much further than important. What did they make? South of Children's Emporia. clothes. Yeah, so she would take right. the bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, see, this wasn't here yeah. then. Yeah. I-35 wasn't there like then. Like, so. The turning pipe didn't like that. They might have been. Yeah. Well, the would've turnpike been. was there, but that would. Oh, I see. That's way that's too far. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going to be around the next week or so, or are you leaving? And you worked over at Clay Como? I probably, yes. when I make yeah. this transcript, I'm probably going to have to call you just About to 40 years. a couple of spellings. Okay. You threw some names and, at me. And, <laughs> and you were just, you were engineering. What were you engineering? After I get it done, I'll call Not you. Not on the vehicles, sure. but on the facilities to make on the, on the line? The building, grounds, conveyors, spray booths, ovens. Right, okay. Everything He's the took one they to make the vehicles. They call, they keep calling him back to... Oh yeah, they, you still troubleshoot for them? I haven't for a couple of years. Yeah. I, re, I retired and then uh, 19 years later I was still going back part-time and uh, consulting. Is this a Clay Como? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's one of the few uh, plants that never shut down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They've been blessed. Yeah, actually, they're the right products. Are they making? Is Ford is doing much better than the other American oh, yeah. makers? Yeah, are they actually they're... making money? Yes, they did last quarter. Uh huh. A couple billion. <laughs> better, <laughs> better than uh, they have uh, General Motors. Oh yeah, they have products that uh, people want. What a terrible thought. <laughs> He's got a red Mustang convertible. I call it useless you don't until like it? this kind of weather. <laughs> you don't like it? Winter time. What would you like to drive? Would I you? drive a Honda Element. <laughs> useless. An Element, there you see. Now, they make the uh, escapes up there at Clay yes. Corona, don't uh -huh. they? And they make the hybrid escapes up there too? Yes. And the 150 pickup. Yeah. You know, I'd look at a Mustang because I think it's it's cool, but I don't like that rear wheel drive. Oh, I've gotten married to that front wheel drive, and I think it's strictly rear wheel, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to do that in the winter around here. 
Well, we've got her all-wheel drive <laughs> element. That's the what her little car. SUV is for. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Well, it's, it's not a problem. It's hard to shut me up when she gets...